Good afternoon and welcome to our press conference. It's very good to see many of you here in the room again and also obviously very welcome to those who join us uh, remotely. We are here on stage with President Lagarde and Vice President de Guindos. My name is Wolfgang Preussel. Later in the question and answer session, I would like to ask you to identify yourself and if you are joining or if you are asking a question remotely, put on your camera and your microphone since we want to hear and see you. And with this, I would like to hand over to President Lagarde. President Lagarde, please. Thank you very much and good afternoon uh, to all of you. The Vice President and I welcome you to this press conference. Today, in line with our strong commitment to our price stability mandate, the Governing Council took further key steps to make sure that inflation returns to our 2% target over the medium term. We decided to raise the three key ECB interest rates by 50 basis points and approved the transmission protection instrument that I will refer to as TPI. The Governing Council judged that it is appropriate to take a larger first step on its policy rate normalization path than signaled at its previous meeting. This decision is based on our updated assessment of inflation risks and the reinforced support provided by the TPI for the effective transmission of monetary policy. It will support the return of inflation to our medium-term target by strengthening the anchoring of inflation expectations and by ensuring that demand conditions adjust to deliver our inflation target in the medium term. At our upcoming meetings, further normalization of interest rates will be appropriate. The front-loading today of the exit from negative interest rates allows us to make a transition to a meeting-by-meeting meeting approach to our interest rate decisions. Our future policy rate path will continue to be data-dependent and will help us deliver on our 2% inflation target over the medium term. In the context of our policy normalization, we will evaluate options for remunerating excess liquidity holdings. We assessed that the establishment of the TPI is necessary to support the effective transmission of monetary policy. In particular, as we continue normalizing monetary policy, the transmission protection instrument will ensure that our monetary policy stance is transmitted smoothly across all Euro area countries. The singleness of our monetary policy is a precondition for the ECB to be able to deliver on its price stability mandate. The TPI will be an addition to our toolkit and can be activated to counter unwarranted disorderly market dynamics that pose a serious threat to the transmission of monetary policy across the euro area. The scale of TPI purchases depends on the severity of the risks facing policy transmission. Purchases are not restricted ex ante. By safeguarding the transmission mechanism, the TPI will allow the Governing Council to more effectively deliver on its price stability mandate. In any event, the flexibility in reinvestment of redemptions coming due in the Pandemic Emergency Programme portfolio remains the first line of defence to counter risks to the transmission mechanism related to the pandemic. The decisions taken today are set out in a press release available on our website and the details of the TPI are described in a separate press release that will be published at 3.45. I will now outline in more detail 
how we see the economy and inflation developing, and will then explain our assessment of financial and monetary conditions. So, economic activity is slowing. Russia's unjustified aggression towards Ukraine is an ongoing drag on growth. The impact of high inflation on purchasing power, continuous supply constraints, and higher uncertainty are having a dampening effect on the economy. Firms continue to face higher costs and disruptions in their supply chains, although there are tentative signs that some of the supply bottlenecks are easing. Taken together, these factors are significantly clouding the outlook for the second half of 2022 and beyond. At the same time, economic activity continues to benefit from the reopening of the economy, from a strong labor market, and from fiscal policy support. In particular, the full reopening of economy is supporting spending in the services sector. As people start to travel again, tourism is expected to help the economy in the third quarter of this year. Consumption is being supported by the savings that households built up during the pandemic and by a strong labor market. Fiscal policy is helping to cushion the impact of the war in Ukraine for those bearing the brunt of higher energy prices. Temporary and targeted measures should be tailored so, that, so, so as to limit the risk of fueling inflationary pressures. Fiscal policies in all countries should aim at preserving debt sustainability as well as raising the growth potential in a sustainable manner to enhance the recovery. Inflation increased to 8.6% in June. Surging prices were again the most important component of overall inflation. Market-based indicators suggest that global energy prices will stay high in the near term. Food inflation also rose further, standing at 8.9% in June, in part reflecting the importance of Ukraine and Russia as producers of agricultural goods. Persistent su supply bottlenecks for industrial goods and recovering demand, especially in the services sector, are also contributing to the current high rate of inflation. Price pressures are spreading across more and more sectors, in part owing to the indirect impact of high energy costs across the whole economy. Accordingly, most measures of underlying inflation have risen further. We expect inflation to remain undesirably high for some time, owing to continued pressure from energy and food prices and pipeline pressures in the pricing chain. Higher inflation pressures are also stemming from the depreciation of the euro exchange rate. But looking further ahead, in the absence of new disruptions, energy costs should stabilize and supply bottlenecks should ease, which together with the, opening of policy, with the ongoing policy normalization should support the return of inflation to our target. The labor market remains strong. Unemployment fell to a historical low of 6.6% in May. Job vacancies across many sectors show that there is a robust demand for labor. Wage growth, also according to forward-looking indicators, has continued to increase gradually over the last few months, but still remains contained overall. Over time, the strengthening of the economy and some catch-up effects should support faster growth in wages. Most measures of longer-term inflation expectations 
currently stand at around 2%, although recent above-target revisions to some indicators warrant continued monitoring. Risk assessment. A prolongation of the war in Ukraine remains a source of significant downside risk to growth, especially if energy supplies from Russia were to be disrupted to such an extent that it led to rationing for firms and households. The war may also further dampen confidence and aggravate supply-side constraints, while energy and food costs could remain persistently higher than expected. A faster deceleration in global growth would also pose a risk to the euro area outlook. The risks to the inflation outlook continue to be on the upside and have intensified, particularly in the short term. The risks to the medium term inflation outlook include a durable worsening of the production capacity of our economy, persistently high energy and food prices, inflation expectations rising above our target, and higher than anticipated wage rises. However, if demand were to weaken over the medium term, it would lower pressures on prices. So turning to financial and monetary conditions now. Market interest rates have been volatile as a result of the pronounced economic and geopolitical uncertainty. Bank funding costs have risen in recent months, which has increasingly fed into higher bank lending rates, in particular for households. While the volume of bank lending to households remains strong, it is expected to decline in view of lower demand. Lending to firms has also been robust as high production costs, inventory building, and lower reliance on market funding have created a continued need for credit from banks. At the same time, demand for loans to finance investment has declined. Money growth has continued to moderate owing to lower liquidity savings and lower euro system asset purchases. Our most recent bank lending survey reports that credit standards tightened for all loan categories in the second quarter of the year, as banks are becoming more concerned about the risks faced by their customers in the current uncertain environment. Banks expect to continue tightening their credit standards in the third quarter. So, summing up, inflation continues to be undesirably high and is expected to remain above our target for some time. The latest data indicates a slowdown in growth, clouding the outlook for the second half of 22 and beyond. At the same time, this slowdown is being cushioned by a number of supportive factors. The Governing Council has today decided to raise the key ECB interest rates and approved the transmission protection instrument. At our upcoming meetings, further normalization of interest rates will be appropriate. Our future policy rate path will continue to be data dependent and will help us deliver on our 2% inflation target over the medium term. We now stand ready to adjust all of our instruments within our mandate to ensure that inflation stabilizes at our 2% target over the medium term. Our new transmission protection instrument will safeguard the smooth trans transmission of our monetary policy stance throughout the euro area as we keep adjusting the stance to address high inflation. We're now ready to take your questions. Thank you, President Lagarde. And the first question today goes to Annette Weisbach of uh, CNBC. 
Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, President Lagarde. Good afternoon. My, my first question is on um, your forward guidance and what the front loading means for September, because you previously has been guiding us and the market that September will see a 50 basis point hike unless there is a clear signs of inflation going down. Second question is on Italy. We are seeing yields rising. Um, with the political uncertainty at center stage. Um, what's your message to the markets? Is the TPI big enough and bold enough to prevent a potential escalation of the situation? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And um, actually, your question helps me uh, give you a bit of an insight of what happened during this really important Governing Council meeting. Governing Council members around the table made two important decisions. The first one had to do with interest rate hikes by 50 basis points, and I will come back to forward guidance in a minute, and also decided to approve at unanimity, unanimity of the Governing Council, the transmission protection instrument. So let me come back to uh, the interest rate hikes that we decided. And I will come back as a result to your forward guidance question. We debated internally within uh, the Governing Council about the pros and cons of sticking to the signaled 25 basis point of July, which entailed uh, the other forward guidance that we gave in respect of September, and the two of them were clearly a package. And having weighed the pros and cons, we decided on balance that it was appropriate to take a larger step towards exiting from negative interest rates. Okay? And we did that on the basis of uh, several indicators, several elements which we believe constituted a change relative to our June Amsterdam meeting. And I can come back to those four elements because I think they're important. They all relate to you know, materialization of uh, inflation risks that we had flagged in Amsterdam, but which, which we have seen materializing in the meantime. And I think the second important component uh, that played a role in our uh, decision was that the situation has changed in relation to transmission. We had not implemented yet uh, the flexible reinvestment uh, under, the, under PEP, and certainly we did not have at the time a transmission protection instrument. So these two elements combined, realization of upside risks to inflation, plus the presence and the operationality of the flexible uh, reinvestment under PEP, and more importantly, the unanimous support of the Governing Council for the Transmission Protection Instrument led us to uh, decide a larger than what had been signaled uh, rate hikes on the occasion of this meeting. That is really what, uh, what if you want to go sort of behind uh, the curtain of the Governing Council debates, this is, this is what took place. I would add that in relation to the rate hikes. We had the debate, weighted the pros and cons, and at the end of the discussion, all members of the Governing Council rallied to the consensus of 50 basis points. So it's a, it's a strong indication on both accounts uh, in relation to the higher step that we are taking to exit from uh, negative interest rates, and on the other front, which is making sure that our monetary policy stance is transmitted smoothly throughout the entire uh, euro area. Now, the um, TPI uh, is, is obviously uh, an instrument that will help us deliver on our mandate of price stability, bringing inflation in the medium term back to, back to 2%. And under that TPI, all members of the euro area can be eligible, all of them. You will find in the press release later after this press conference the detail of the eligibility conditions. 
but all members of the euro areas are eligible. The Governing Council, in its discretion, in its assessment, will determine on the basis of the eligibility criteria, on the basis of the indicators that will signal or not uh, unwarranted disorderly market dynamics, whether or not a country is eligible and whether it activates the TPI. Voila. Thank you. Thank you, President Lagarde. And the next question goes to Alexander Weber um, of Bloomberg. Alexander, please. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Alexander Weber with Bloomberg. Um, I wanted Good to follow afternoon. up. Good afternoon, President Lagarde. I want to follow up on Italy. Um, given that right now there's a very clear reason behind market reaction, um, do you see any way for you to buy Italian debt in the foreseeable future while arguing that um, market reaction was unwarranted, uh, which would be the condition for the TPI? And then um, coming back to the September decision, is this really now um, the, the interest rate decision for September? Is it really completely open now? Or do you still envision uh, a move of larger than 25 basis points? On your first question, um, as I have just described uh, TPI, and I'm happy to come back to that in terms of eligibility conditions and uh, uh, decision making of the governing council, TPI is a program that is designed to address a specific risk that all euro area countries can face. So all euro area countries are in principle eligible to the TPI. Subject to what? Subject to being considered by the Governing Council as eligible to the TPI on the basis notably Notably, not exclusively, it will be the discretion of the Governing Council to make the decision. Notably on the basis of criteria that are very specifically spelt out. If and when the TPI needs to be activated, obviously the Governing Council is going to conduct a thorough assessment of the situation in the affected countries. And the decision to begin TPI purchases, as I said, will be in the entire discretion of the Governing Council. Now, clearly, to assess whether uh, you have unwarranted, disorderly market dynamics, the Governing Council will take into account multiple indicators to determine the warranted versus unwarranted and to determine the orderly versus disorderly. And multiple indicators have been discussed and will be um, taken into account by the Governing Council. You wanted to come. Yeah, you wanted to come back to September. That's a that's a good point. I think I had I had addressed that issue with uh, with uh, you you colleague uh, sitting next to you. I think I, what I tried to explain in my first answer is that in June we have signalled. It's not exactly what I said, by the way. Neither in my blog nor in my Simtra speech. Just in case any of you is interested and very scrupulous and scrutinises uh, those documents. But at our Amsterdam June meeting, we signaled our intention to increase by 25 basis points. And that was a signal, some you know, a degree of forward guidance to that signal, that was coupled with the signal that was given in relation to September. Given the decision that we are taking today, which is to increase, and remember Amsterdam, for those of you who have forgotten, was we intend to increase by 25 basis points, and at our September meeting, the incremental increase will be uh, possibly larger than 25. And some of you have assumed that it might be 50. But we decided to go for 50 basis points hike in June. And therefore, the combined forward guidance that existed for September is no longer applicable. I think if you go back to the monetary policy statement, you see very clearly that from now on, we will make our monetary policy decisions on a data-dependent basis, will operate month by month, and step by step. So what happens in September is going to depend on what data we have for September, 
but we are definitely on a normalization pace, path rather, in order to reach our medium term objective of 2%. So let me repeat again, because you seem to frown. We will determine in September on the basis of the data that we receive, and this is a projection exercise in September, remember? That will include all the National Central Bank in the exercise. So on the basis of the data that we receive at the time of those projections, we will determine what step we take on the normalization path that we are taking in order to deliver on our medium term 2%. Now, that doesn't mean to say that we are changing the ultimate point of arrival, okay? We are accelerating the exit and we are following the, pace of no the path of normalization that we have flagged. Thank you. Thank you, President Lagarde. The next question goes to Francisca Kuhs of uh, ZDF German Television. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for having my question, um, which is the following. How will the ECB decision on the interest rates affect the retail investors uh, in the medium and long term? More specifically, I'm wondering what kind of effect it will have on just a normal private person that is in the market and now wondering um, what this will do with his or her money. Well, first, you know, we are moving all three interest rates by 50, uh, 50 basis points. So, obviously, uh, the cost of funding um, for banks and the cost of credit for those who borrow from banks is assuming good transmission, which I do, given that we have a transmission protection mechanism and that we are very attentive to that, will go up. That's pretty obvious. And... Why is that actually beneficial at the end of the day for those in the retail sector, for those consumers, for all economic agents, is that what we, the most precious good that we can deliver and that we have to deliver is price stability. So we have to bring inflation down to 2% in the medium term. That is, uh, that is the imperative under the treaty, that is the strategy review objective that we have set for ourselves, and it's, it's, it's time to deliver. Thank you. And the next question will turn to WebEx and it goes to Francesco Canepa of Reuters. Francesco, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Good afternoon. So my first question is um, whether you are going to um, announce TPI purchases when you make them and whether you are going to sterilize them. And if so, how? And if so, what? If so, how? Eh? How? Oh, how? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your question. Um, as far as uh, publication is concerned, publication uh, will take place in due course according to publishing principles and rules uh, that we apply. Okay, so that's answer to your question one. And as far as the other question is concerned, I would just like to clarify that if TPI is activated, if TPI is activated, it will avoid interference with the appropriate monetary policy stance, and we will address the implications of TPI purchases for the scale of the aggregate Eurosystem monetary policy debt security portfolio and the amount of excess liquidity. I'm not going to go through the details of exactly using which mechanism, sterilization or otherwise, that we would be using, these are practical matters that certainly have been discussed, have been agreed, but if you don't mind, uh, the transmission protection instrument is intended to facilitate, enhance transmission uh, of our monetary policy stance in particular circumstances that we will address, and the ECB will be capable of doing that. And the ECB is capable of going big for that. Thank you, President Lagarde. And I'll take another question from WebEx, and this one goes to Tonia Mastroboni uh, of La Repubblica. Tonia, please. Uh, Tonia, we can't hear anything. Can you hear us, and can you unmute, perhaps? 
doesn't seem to work, I will come back to you um, afterwards. So I would like then to go to Martin Arnold of the Financial Times. Martin, please. Thank you very much, Madame Lagarde. Uh, back in March 2020, you said that uh, you were not here to close the spreads. Uh, does this transmission protection instrument mean that you are now here to close the spreads? And will it be used to counter the increase in borrowing costs that we've seen in Italy as a result of the political uncertainty that's developed there? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you give me another opportunity to clarify exactly what TPI is about. Uh, TPI is going to be an addition to our toolkit. And it can be activated to counter unwarranted, disorderly market dynamics that pose a serious threat to the transmission of monetary policy across the euro area. And why do we do that? Because we want to make sure that we deliver on our mandate. We want to uh, make sure that our monetary policy stance is transmitted throughout the entire uh, euro area. It's not the only tool that we have in our toolkit. We have two existing tools already. Uh, we have number one, PEP, and in particular the flexible reinvestment of uh, redemptions, as we uh, announced back in June, which is now operational. So the flexible reinvestment of uh, PEP is operational, and it allows us uh, to deal with unwarranted fragmentation risks that are created as a result of pandemic risks. We have OMT, which gives us a tool to deal with unwarranted impairment to transmission that are caused by redenomination risks and that are country specific. And now we have TPI that I have just described in order to counter unwarranted disorderly market dynamics. So we have the three instruments in the toolbox and they all can be operated. As I have said, uh, and I will uh, repeat, TPI is a program designed for specific circumstances to address specific risks, but that is available to all countries of the euro area, because our concern is that monetary policy is transmitted throughout the entire area. So when the governing council will determine that a country is eligible under the four criteria that I'm happy to uh, come back to, if you want, uh, and on the basis of the indicators that there is disorderly market dynamics, then it will decide that that country is eligible to TPI. It will activate TPI. And as I said earlier on, there is no ex ante limit to that program. Now, I'm happy to go to the, uh, the four uh, specific criteria uh, if any of you is interested. Maybe I will. Yeah. So there are four of them, and I think it's important that we understand that on this occasion, like on any occasion having to do with either monetary policy stance or monetary policy transmission, the ECB determines in its own discretion not being hostage to anyone. So the four criteria that it will use will be indicative, will be elements of information that it will take into account in order to make its decision. So the first one is compliance with EU fiscal framework. And that can take one of two forms, either not be in excessive deficit procedure or uh, having failed to take the effective action in response to council recommendations. So that's on the fiscal framework. And obviously it borrows from uh, the European, another European institution, which is both the Commission and the Council. The second is the absence of severe macroeconomic imbalances. And again, it's, it borrows from other European institutions in relation to the excessive imbalance procedure. The third is fiscal sustainability. So this is making sure that the trajectory of public debt is sustainable 
And to do that, the Governing Council will take into account analysis by the European Commission, by the ESM, by the IMF, by other institutions, but it will certainly be together with the ECB internal uh, analysis. And fourth, uh, sound and sustainable macroeconomic policies complying with the commitments submitted in the country's recovery and resilience plans for the RRF and the European Commission specific recommendations in the fiscal sphere under the European semester. So you have a combination of uh, criteria ranging from fiscal to macroeconomy uh, to um, compliance with the RRPs in particular, and obviously the DSA. So all these four categories will be taken into account by the Governing Council, but once again, the Governing Council decides in sovereignty in respect to eligibility to the TPI. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. And the next question goes to Aude Kersulek of the French television, uh, BFM TV. Aude, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mrs. Lagarde. Uh, the hypothesis of the total gas cut from Russia uh, by this winter is more and more credible. And you just spoke about uh, downside risk, and some institutional uh, studies show that this will lead to recession and raise energy costs again. Uh, if that happens, will this be a signal to reverse monetary policy and uh, become a commodity again? Uh, what could be the reaction of uh, the ECB? Well, thank you very much uh, for your question. But as, as you know, the primary mandate of the ECB is price stability, which we have defined as the 2% uh, inflation medium term. And what we observe is on the outlook front, and on the inflation front, and we try to assess what are the risks to both. We see downside risk to growth. I've explained that in detail in the monetary policy statement and made specific reference to the um, unjustifiable, unacceptable um, invasion of Russia against Ukraine and consequences as a result of it. And we are seeing upside risk to inflation particularly in, this, in the short term, but, but, you know, sort of spreading. So, as ECB, what we have to do is act in relation to inflation, given the circumstances. That's what we're doing. To your question about the impact of gas, it is clear that energy prices play a critical role in the high inflation numbers that we are seeing, that are undesirable and that we will unfortunately continue to see for some time. So we are very attentive to what happens on the energy front and in particular on the gas front because it has an impact on electricity price as we all know. So most recent evolution concerning uh, the gas supply through Nord Stream 1 in particular is obviously a factor that we take into account. And the decisions that have been announced by the European Commission in relation to um, savings, in relation to solidarity, in relation to inventory, are also taken into account in relation to the role that energy plays in relation to inflation, but also obviously in relation to growth. So we are very attentive to all these, these factors. Is that going to lead to a recession? You know, we look at our projection dating back to June, we look at the most recent forecast published by the Commission last week. Under the baseline scenario, there is no recession, neither this year nor next year. Is the horizon clouded? Of course it is. Thank you. Thank you, President. And we'll try it again with uh, Tonia Mastroboni uh, of La Repubblica. Tonia, please. Yes, hello. Um, hello, Madame Lagarde, and sorry. Uh, I couldn't uh, cope with my technical problems. Sure. Uh, good afternoon. I have two questions. Uh, the first, I would like to go back to Italy, of course, because uh, it's not only a question of debt. I mean, um, how worried about are you about the, the collapse of the Draghi government also due the, to the fact that uh, Italy will become a large part of the next generation EU, which will fuel uh, also the, 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 the growth in, in the Eurozone? And that this uh, his uh, reform path, and so 
uh, also the next generation EU money it receives could be interrupted by this uh, political crisis. So uh, also uh, threatening the growth uh, outlook in, in the whole Eurozone. And my second question, I mean, very often in the last uh, uh, decade, at least, um, and, uh, and uh, the rises of, 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 of rates on government bonds were caused by political crisis. Um, so if I'm not wrong, you mentioned the four criteria and Italy would meet these criteria at this moment. But this is, uh, 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 of course, a crisis which is caused by a political uh, reason, by political cause, a government crisis, uh, self-inflicted by Italy. Uh, would you think that this could be considered uh, uh, as an unwarranted rise of interest rates on uh, of rates on on the on the government bonds if if it went on? The spread is already rising this morning. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your for your question. Um, let me just remind you that the ECB does not take a stance on political matters. Political matters are for the democratic process of each and every member state. And that is certainly the case for the country that uh, you're referring to. Differences in local financing can legitimately arise, among others due to the country's specific macroeconomic landscape. And that has happened in the past. So the Governing Council will make the assessment of whether, of whether a country meet the eligibility criteria or not at the time when it has to make those determination. And it will do so having a, 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 a sort of threefold uh, assessment, if you will. First of all, it will determine a comprehensive assessment of market and transmission indicators. There's a whole range of such indicators. Second, it will at that time evaluate the eligibility criteria. And third, and that's very important, it will have to make a judgment call that activation of purchases under the TPI is proportionate to the achievement of the ECB primary objective. Now, those of you who are familiar with the legal requirements and with the concept of proportionality will have understood what I mean by that. But this is obviously operational in relation to any activation decision that uh, is, being is being made. Thank you, President. And now the next question goes to Pablo Rodriguez of El Mundo. Pablo, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Madam. Uh, I have a couple of questions, if I may. Um, the first one is that 14 years ago, one of your predecessors here, uh, when uh, there was a rise in, in the rates, he dismisses the argument 14 that he... years ago? Sorry? 14. Oh, okay. 14 years ago. 14. 14. Okay, one okay, four, okay. Yeah. Uh, he said... Uh, he, he dismisses the argument that the rise would put further strain in the peripheral countries. And he said, I don't buy that argument. I was wondering if now you kind of buy that argument, because in a sense, this new instrument you are announcing, even though it's just an extra one, basically those criteria describe pretty, pretty well those countries in problems that 14 years ago may need the help of, of the ECB. So do you think that the economies are more... Um, resilient right now, or the, just an instrument as it is, it will help them to uh, compensate uh, the effects of the new rate. And, and the second one, if I may, is um, the Spanish government has announced a new tax on banks for windfall profits. I was wondering, because they explained they do that because of the raise, uh, interest rates uh, rise. And I was wondering if you have an assessment, you will uh, eventually have an assessment, and you have an opinion as you have in the past, uh, because it has happened before in other countries, and I was wondering, you think it's actually a good answer for after what has been announced, or just because of what has been announced today here? Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. I think your second question will be addressed by my colleague, the Vice President de Guindos. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Well, it's very difficult to, to give an opinion when you do not know, you know, the concrete details uh, of, the, of the tax, we do not know the, the characteristics, we do, not, we do not know whether it will be, you know, a tax on, on profits, it will be a tax on, on assets. So, it's, uh, you know, that's the first uh, thing that we have to say. We do not know the details, and so our opinion uh, cannot be complete in that respect. What I can uh, tell you is what has been our policy line in the past with respect to taxation of, uh, of banks. No? 
And if you look at our opinions in the past, uh, they are quite clear. What uh, you know, they tried to, to, to make uh, quite explicit is that the tax should not impair uh, great extension, great growth, because this is important for, for, for economic activity. Second, that uh, should, we should try to avoid any sort of tightening of financing conditions for households and corporates. And finally, that uh, the, the tax should not uh, damage the solvency of the banking industry. This has been always, you know, in the, the opinions that we have produced in the past, uh, has been always, uh, you know, this kind of message to the, to the, to the governments. But uh, I repeat again, we do not know the, the concrete characteristics and features of the, of the Spanish tax that has been announced, as you have said, by the Spanish government. And so, uh, uh, in order to have a much more concrete and specific uh, answer and response and opinion, we will have to wait a little bit. Yeah, and, and to your first point, um, you know, that helps me to yet again come back to, uh, to TPI, because in, in the monetary union, uh, there is an inherent risk, particularly the, the monetary union that, that we have um, here in the euro area. There's an inherent risk that a large shock can create fragmentation risks. And that can lead to self-fulfilling market dynamics that are not warranted. And it matters for the singleness of our monetary policy in our monetary union. But those impediments uh, can have different sources. And that is the reason why we have several tools. As I said earlier on, we have the flexible reinvestment of PEP, which has been deployed, is currently operational. We have OMT, which was decided back then for another unwarranted um, disorderly uh, market dynamics, but having to do with more country-specific uh, matters, and closely associated with the redenomination risk, because that's really what it was designed for at the time, if you remember. So we were short of this particular tool, which is the one that uh, we have uh, in front of us, the transmission protection instrument that is not related to redenomination risks, but to the unwarranted disorderly market dynamic, dynamics that can impair uh, the proper transmission of monetary policy throughout the euro area, which is, as I said again, it's with no limitation ex ante, which has been designed carefully with adequate attention paid to the safeguards that are necessary for that instrument to be valid and with a, a creditor seniority that is pari passu with any other creditor um, in order for it to be, uh, to be efficient and not to crowd out. So that's, uh, that's what we have done. And uh, I can assure you that uh, we would rather not use TPI. The governing council would rather not use it. But if we have to use it, we will not hesitate. We will not hesitate. Thank you. Thank you. Next question goes to Roland Koopman of the Dutch television channel RTL. Roland, Thank you please. and good afternoon, Madam President. Um, I'm over here. Where are you? I'm here, to your right. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, got two, uh, got, I've got two uh, brief questions. Your, your um, a previous forward, forward guidance to this uh, uh, rate decision is about five weeks old. Um, yet the uh, rate hike decision is a lot bigger than anticipated. Did the uh, monetary conditions in the Eurozone deteriorate that fast, or is the agreement on TPI uh, giving you uh, the ability to go further than you um, anticipated? Uh, second question, uh, you stated that you're on the path towards normalization. Uh, what interest levels are considered normal uh, by the ECB. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the reason we decided by total consensus around the table to depart from the signal that we had given back in Amsterdam was twofold. Number one, we had clear realization of upside risk to inflation, and I can give you a list of those examples. Inflation 
going from 8.1% in May to 8.6% in June, way above our forecast. Uh, seasonally adjusted month-on-month -month inflation rates uh, that show strong inflation momentum for nearly uh, all components. Number three, a broad range of indicators of underlying inflation that have continued to increase and pipeline pressures that are rising to record high levels. And added to that, which relates essentially to inflation, the euro-dollar um, rate uh, that has fallen substantially in the last uh, few weeks, which obviously has a bearing on inflation going forward. So it's on the basis of that set of monetary policy related, uh, monetary policy stance related uh, elements that we have taken the decision. As I said, twofold, inflation related, and second, the fact that the concern that we had about monetary policy transmission is addressed by number one, the deployment of the TPI, the uh, PEP flexible reinvestment policy, and second, the unanimous support of the entire governing council to a strong and powerful transmission protection instrument that I have just described earlier on. So on the stance front, we had good reasons to revisit, and on the transmission, we are confident that the existence of that mechanism, its ability to be deployed, is actually reinforcing our capacity uh, to deliver on our uh, price stability mandate and to walk that journey of monetary policy normalization. Now, as I said earlier on, going from the signal 25 to the 50 that you are seeing now is a higher step out of negative interest rates. So we're now moving in one go to zero. Does that mean that we are uh, changing the, 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 the terminal rate at which we want to arrive? No. Does that mean that we are going to move extremely fast? As I said, we will be operating month by month, meeting by meeting, on the basis of data, and we will adjust and calibrate accordingly. Uh, we are much more flexible in that we are not offering forward guidance of any kind. I was asked several, several times the questions about uh, September. Um, there is no such thing. We are data dependent. But the ultimate destination of our policy path remains the same, which is to progressively raise interest rates to broadly neutral setting. That, that's where we want to arrive at. Okay? And if you're asking me next, what is the neutral setting? At this point in time, I don't know. What I can observe is that it has changed over the course of the last few years for a reason of factors having to do with demographics, with productivity, and all the rest of it. And as seen by markets, it has also significantly adjusted in the last few weeks. So we will cross that bridge when we cross that bridge. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question goes to Christian Siedenbiedel of F FAZ, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Yeah, Madame, Madame Lagarde, do you think this is a historic moment? Are you personally glad that the time with the negative interest rates is over now? i tell you something. I think it's a rather historical moment, for me at least, um, for two reasons. One is, it's, it's, it's very good when a whole team, the whole governing council, 25 members around the table, actually are in complete alignment and support for a transmission protection instrument which we regard as critical in order to properly transmit our monetary policy going forward. So in that respect, at least from the president of the ECB point of view, yes, I think it's, it's quite a, a gratifying moment. It means that staff has done an enormous amount of work, that all members of the committees uh, that uh, are bringing together the expert of the national central banks, Bundesbank included, of course, uh, have worked really hard, and that we have um, come to the same view without any reservation. So it is, it is important in that respect. I think you know, it's the first time in over a decade that we raise interest rates. And uh, moving out of negative interest rates, by all accounts, 
certainly to me, uh, is going to facilitate a number of things that we can explain to European citizens uh, in order to help them understand what we are trying to do in order to reduce inflation and in order to procure price stability. So in those two respects, yes. But, you know, I have a short history as a central banker. The last question goes to Isabella Bufaki of Il Sole Vente Quattro. Isabella, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, and Good thank afternoon. you very much for the opportunity. If I may go back to TPI, um, you called it a program and uh, a mechanism. The market calls it a shield, and we look at it as a shield that can protect all countries. Uh, but uh, it's also complex, uh, and by the way you described it, how fast can you trigger if a country needs this kind of shield? And uh, w once you trigger it, it means that the country is protected uh, for uh, as much as um, needed. And then a second question on Taltros, because banks are worried that you might uh, modify Taltros, the targeted uh, longer-term financing operations, uh, with the rise of interest rates, whether it is so, whether it was discussed or it is in program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the transmission protection instrument is an instrument. Okay? It's, it's one that is uh, intended for transmission of monetary policy throughout the euro area. So we intend to use it as a tool to make sure that monetary policy is transmitted throughout the region, our region, and is smoothly transmitted without being impaired by unwarranted disorderly market dynamics. It is not so complicated. You will see because the, uh, the, the press release will be out in two minutes. And it will not give you, by the way, all details. Okay? It will give you some of the eligibility conditions, some key terms and conditions, but you should not expect all details to be there because there is an element of discretion and judgment on the part of the governing council members to decide or not activation and to assess eligibility or not. And there are certain components that are best kept unpublished and disclosed and commented upon. And I'm sure that you understand. This instrument has been developed in record time by our teams. They can work fast, we work fast, and we can do so at any point in time in relation to eligibility, in relation to activation, in relation to drafting, which has been the case. On Teltro, uh, as you will have noted in the monetary policy statement, there is a particular sentence which says, in the context of our policy normalization, we will evaluate options for remunerating excess liquidity holdings. You know, what has worked in one direction has to be identified, analyzed, and properly addressed in the other direction. We are now in the process of normalizing. Other principles apply. And that's what we will do uh, in the near future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That brings our press conference to an end. Thanks a lot for joining. Our next regular press conference is scheduled for the 8th uh, of September. Until then, we wish you a good summer and a good afternoon, and bye-bye. <laughs>